And then, of course, there's a growth of hospice. I don't have to tell members of this audience about the great work of Dr. Cicely Saunders, who started out as a social worker, or an almoner, as they call them in England, then became a nurse, and then went to medical school, became a physician, and founded the two first hospices in London in 1967. In 1974, uh, one of our own physicians at the Yale Medical School, actually the chairman of the urology department, spent a year working with her, came back, and with members of the clergy, members of the Yale Medical Faculty, formed Connecticut Hospice. And then hospices, of course, began to grow throughout the country. There are now 3,500 hospices, not necessarily institutional hospices. They may be outpatient facilities, but whatever it is, they are available and they are covered uh, by Medicare, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. One third, fully one third of dying Americans use a hospice in one form or another before their deaths. And that's a huge increase from what it was when this book was written. A million people a year have been patients either as outpatients at the hospice facility or actually as inpatients there. So there have been these remarkable, I think, changes. Another one is the growth of the profession of medical ethics or biomedical ethics. It didn't exist in 1967. Uh, people who study the history of the field and the history of philosophy, as a matter of fact, point out that American philosophy in general was in uh, a bit of a quagmire at that time. They were seeking something new, and they fortunately found it in the notion of bioethics. And bioethics, which permeates now. Every aspect of medical care has grown and grown and grown from the original think tanks to many think tanks. As many of you know, there have been two uh, bioethics consultation groups, presidential consultation groups, formed one during the uh, Bush administration, interestingly enough, and then when the Obama administration came in, they felt that the commission they had was too theoretical but they needed really practical advice, so they fired everybody and started with another group of much more practical-minded bioethicists. But they are there to give advice to the president. As you know, they were instrumental in many ways in, involving, in, in being involved with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, much of their advice was not followed, but at least they, they did have a hand in that. There are four principles to bioethics. Probably almost everybody here knows that. The first principle, autonomy. It is the life of the patient. It is not the life or value system of the doctor or of the clergyman or of the nurse or even necessarily the family. The patient must be an, aut an autonomous agent who is given all the information needed, all the information required, to then make a decision. Now, there are a lot of practical problems with this, but the thesis is basically the correct one and a very different way of looking at it than we did before the professional bioethicists came into being. Almost uh, half a century ag ago now, the uh, next principle is called beneficence. And this is one of the precepts in what I call the goodness of the physician. The third is almost the obverse of that, non-maleficence, the Hippocratic principle. First, do no harm. Primum non nocere. One does not, under any circumstances, do physical, psychological harm to a patient. This becomes a very, very complicated ball of wax when we think of all of the new treatments for malignancies of various sorts, which of course continue to make many people much worse than they were before they started therapy. Some people to the point where they refuse therapy because they have seen what loved ones have gone through. And the fourth one, the fourth one which 
has never been followed in our country is justice. You all know we live in one of the few countries of the world where it is very difficult to get first-rate medical care unless you have the proper insurance, the proper amounts of money in your pocketbook, and the vast majority of Americans, other than the Medicare group, do not have that. And large parts of the Medicare group don't have it either because it's a matter of access, and access becomes very difficult. But these are the principles the bioethicists have tried to instill in the rest of us. Justice, autonomy, beneficence, and non-maleficence. Then, Another piece of progress, which was occurring already when this book came out in 1994, was the principle of advanced directives, which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. The Patient Self-Determination Act had been passed by Congress in 1990. The Patient Self-Determination Act allows if a patient cannot make a decision for himself or herself, for someone to be appointed a health care proxy or to have what's called by the lawyer's durable power of attorney to make decisions for that patient. Then an additional factor, an additional improvement, has been the fact that virtually every hospital in this country now has an ethics committee. Ethics committees are charged with solving problems that have to do with ethical responsibilities of physicians, of nurses, of the administration of a hospital, and the responsibilities of the hospital administration and the physicians to the patients. They consist, by and large, of what we call wise heads, uh, senior member, members of a hospital faculty, of a hospital staff, There'll always be a lawyer or two. Uh, if they're lucky, they've got some very good people from the clergy, and there's a representative of the community. So every hospital has such a thing, and if any family or any patient feels that their personal human, humane rights are being challenged or violated, they can turn to the bioethics committee of any hospital for a judgment. And then, finally, there's a factor that is vague, but very, very important, and it grows out of some of the other things I've been saying for the past few minutes. The whole idea of a return to the days of Hippocratic idealism. You know, Western medicine was really started about 350 years before the Common Era by a group of physicians who somehow became known by the name of one of their leaders, Hippocrates. And the Hippocratic doctors introduced a number of new things. They introduced the concept of physical examination. They introduced the idea that one doesn't become sick because the gods are angry with you and you're not going to get better because the gods say, yes, now you should be better. They said you get sick because there's some natural thing going on in your body or there's something out in the climate that is doing it to you uh, or there may be a bunch of insects who come flooding in and, and bite you. These were all new ideas. But they also, in addition to everything else, brought in this concept of the physician's morality and goodness and how the physician himself, and of course in those days it was always himself, by his very presence can instill in a patient the will to get better. We now know with modern studies of placebos that the placebo effect is probably about a third of the effect of the real medicines we take, like the digitalis and the antibiotics and all of this, about a third of it. And when it comes to the drugs that influence mood disorders, like depression, it may be a lot more than that. The, uh, New York Review of Books recently ran two articles by Marcia Angel, who used to be the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, arguing that antidepressants, for example, are pharmacologically much less effective than we have thought, 
and the actual reasons people get better have to do with that placebo effect and the passage of time. So, you know, this becomes another interesting thing to conjure with. But the real question, and the, the question that I started to attack when they contacted me and said, you know, we need another chapter bringing things up to date. The real question is, has how we die in America really changed? In spite of all of the progress, are we moving forward or are we standing still? And I concluded, after all the contacts I made, the places I visited, the people I spoke to, all the bull sessions I had with colleagues, that the French were right. You remember their old saying, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more things stay the same. And I must tell you, that for every one of the ameliorations and improvements I've just described, there are reasons to worry. There are reasons to worry about the present, but perhaps even more so reasons that we have to worry about the future. A lot of them have to do with the technology of medicine, how it has grown enormously, uh, logarithmically, any way you can imagine in these past 15 years, but some of them have to do with other things as well. When you look at a medical school curriculum, I spoke earlier about all the changes we've had in the curriculum, you realize that classroom exercises occur essentially only in the first two years. Then the kids get on the wards, but the first two years there's time for classes, there's time for didactic work, uh, all other teaching after that is from observation, from participation, from going on rounds, little seminars where people sit around, discuss a topic, or grand rounds where a major topic is discussed. But actual classroom exercises occur only in the first two years. A remarkable thing happens at the beginning of the third year. And this hasn't changed in 60 years. Students go on the wards. It's a very exciting time. It is breathlessly exciting. And it turns out, after looking at this whole picture, that the classroom doesn't translate very well to the intensive care unit. What people learn about humanities and ethics and responsibility to the values of the patient, what they learn about the humanities disappears in the thrill of the chase. In this book, How We Die, I talked about what I call the riddle, the exciting riddle of diagnosis and therapy. Suddenly they give you a white coat and a stethoscope and you're a doctor, and my God, it's unbelievable. What a feeling that is. If you've ever flown a Spitfire in combat, which I never did, I imagine it must be exactly like that. In fact, I always, I always call the interns Spitfire pilots. <laughs> And there are those Messerschmitts, you know, up there, the bacteria and the who knows what, and they're shooting them down, and it's great fun. And, and most of their teachers are very young, too, because who teaches medical students? The residents teach the medical students. The junior attendings teach the residents. You don't get a lot of gray hair on the wards. Uh, you get young, excited, enthusiastic people taking care of the sick when often what is needed, as you well know, needed much more is wisdom, is compassion, Buddhist principles, yes, but principles for all of us. Uh, wisdom, it's funny, I'm, I'm going to digress for a moment. I used to love it in my last years of practice when a patient would come in who'd looked up their disease or their planned surgery on the internet and had all sorts of knowledge about it. Well, of course, what they didn't have was knowledge. They had information. Knowledge and information are two very different things. Information is facts. Knowledge is facts in context so that they're completely understood. Wisdom has to do with judgment, how you use your knowledge. And it has largely to do with what's inside you, your life's experience. And clearly, you have to have knowledge and experience to have wisdom. Those are prerequisites, but there, there's far more to it than that. And patients somehow think that if they can Google a damn thing, boy, why do I have to pay $25, 
$25. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean.